so uh, welcome to <laughs> Brockport Free Methodist. We're super glad you're here. Uh, I'm Jenna, and I've got some announcements or something. Um, first, there are communication cards available in your pews. One way you can use them uh, is to submit jokes Andy might want to use when he gets back. So um, start now, he might have some options for when he comes back. Second, Kingdom Mound is next week. Uh, fellow youth people like me who are going, uh, please be at the church next Sunday at 1 p.m. There are still three tickets left. If any students just finishing 6th through 12th grades want to go, I am super excited for it this year. Um, so if you're like me and you like to have fun, um, you can get some more info by going to the website or the Church Center app to register or see Pastor Mike. That's uh, my dad. He'll be off here later. He's the old guy wearing the Superman shirt. So you'll figure it out. Uh, Vacation Bible School. That's this week. Um, I'm super excited for it. So that's all I got to say. If you're helping out or you're going, it's going to be really cool. So that's exciting. Lastly, there is no Adventure Zone, which is for grades 1 through 5. There's none today or for the rest of July. So now please stand, and we're probably going to do worship. Let's uh, lift our Lord and Savior up in song this morning. Look inside the mystery, see the empty cross, see the risen Savior, victorious and strong. No one else, no one else above him, and none is strong to save. Returning, it fills the universe. 
Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found, is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. So teach my song to rise to you When temptation comes my way When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you Amen. Amen. We need you, Lord. Thank you for who you are. For I spoke a word you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me For I took a breath You breathed your life in me And you have been so, so kind to me
When I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. Yes, you did, Lord. Oh, you have been so, so kind to me. There's a God who never stops chasing after us. A God who's never stopped loving us, amen. There's nothing he won't do for us. Let's sing this together. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, that you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, that you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow. Heavenly Father, we come to you today humbly, knowing that our lives are full of sin, but Jesus has washed away that sin, so we can also come to you joyfully, knowing that your love and your grace abounds in our lives. Today there are those that are, are needing healing, maybe physically, maybe emotionally, maybe spiritually. We ask that you would touch them and, and open their hearts to receive your touch at this time. And Father, now prepare our hearts as we listen to the message that you've put on Pastor Mike's heart for us today. In Jesus' name, amen.
So I'm your guest preacher today. <laughs> um, I wanted to tell you that if you got to hear Pastor Lewis last week, so Pastor Andy called me this week and was like, you know, that was really good. We probably need to lower everyone's expectations. Are you available to preach this week? <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah, I could figure something out. <laughs> so many people know that I have a love for Superman shirts. Today, I'm going to share the story with you of why. You may think it's just a simple childhood thing, which it started as. Superman is my favorite hero, mostly because he was the goodest, I felt, of all the superheroes, and I, I just loved that. But today I want to share the story of why it just became kind of a thing for me. Um, I have not shared this story in this church in 16 years, which means I've been here that long, which is crazy to think. But I was thinking about that, and I don't think many of you here have heard this story. And God has been just kind of welling it up in my heart that it's time to share it with the church again. So, this is the story of how I came to faith. Uh, when I was a senior in high school, my parents got divorced. And I was almost 18, but not quite. And they were in the middle of that figuring out, I have two younger sisters, and the who's going to live with who, all of that fun stuff. And I didn't want to pick. <laughs> so I was working at Burger King at the time in Greece. I started out great. Um, and I honestly loved that job. And I met a lot of people at, this, at work. And one of these people I had met, his name was George. Uh, we became friends. And we both realized we both wanted the same thing, and that was to move out of our parents' house. So we got together, and we got our, own, our first apartment together. And uh, George was very different than me. I was, I was kind of like a preppy kid in high school, a very clean cut. I didn't do anything bad. I didn't drink. I didn't smoke. I didn't do any drugs. I played a little bit of sports, like I was that kid. And uh, George was more like one of the kids that was smoking with the kids in the back, like he was that kid. Uh, but we had similar needs. And we got our first apartment, and before too long, George had introduced this idea to me that I completely rejected. Very important for a young man, too. He said, if you would let us have alcohol in this apartment, girls would come. And I said, no, they won't. Girls are very innocent and pure and good. And I honestly felt that way. And no, they won't. This will never work. So he, he kept up on that. I mean, that was a, also a common interest that we had. So at some point... I give in, and I'm like, all right, just to entertain the idea, let's try this. We were both underage, so please, this is all illegal. Um, I should make it clear, I was not a Christian yet. Good Christians would never do this. <laughs> um, so we try it. We have alcohol in our apartment. He invites a bunch of people that he knows, and lo and behold, he wasn't just right uh, he was exceedingly right. I couldn't believe how many people showed up at our place. Uh, girls, guys, people I've never met, had no idea who they were. There was a lot of people, and it kind of blew my mind. It was very eye-opening. My worldview changed in an instant, and I was like, wow, okay, there's this whole other world I did not know about that seems kind of fun. <laughs> so, this kind of started me down this new path. And it wasn't very long-lived, but it, I'm an all-in kind of person. <laughs> I'm a, if you're going to do something, do it with all your heart kind of person. So I got very into this. 
And, I mean, it was to the point where we were planning parties at the beach with kegs and, you know, this kind of stuff. I got pretty bad. <laughs> so, I had started to learn what the partying thing was. And for a young man out of high school, I had started college at MCC. Like, this, this was fun. This was a lot of fun. I was meeting a lot of people. I was meeting a lot of girls. It was nice. Uh, I was very much enjoying myself. I had very much <laughs> gone off course of who I was. Um, but I was having fun. So, I was working at Burger King, and they, uh, they opened a new location right nearby, the one that's actually in the mall food court in Greece right now. I was there when that store first opened. <laughs> I was there when it was brand new. Me and some of the, the other staff from that Greece location moved over to the mall. And one of them was a friend of mine named Brian, who was actually my supervisor. Um, I, had, I had got promoted to be a supervisor, and he was still above me, but we were friends. And we had a bunch of friends on that staff. And a bunch of those friends, it turned out, also liked to party. <laughs> so we started spending quite a bit of time together. One of these friends found out about a party that was going to be happening in Geneseo. It was a frat party. Now, <laughs> To me, having watched movies uh, that were like all about this kind of scene, to me, this was the pinnacle of the party. A college frat party? Yes, please. I couldn't wait to find out what this was like. And somehow, we had figured out how we were going to be able to go. Whew, man, was I excited. Not only were we going to get to go to a college frat party, but this girl that I was super interested in and had been talking to, uh, was going on this trip, and we were going to get to spend some time partying and talking and probably dancing and all fun stuff. I was very excited. Um, so this is a Friday, Friday night. I'm pretty sure it was like after work. We all got together to go to this frat party. This was, oh my goodness, this sounds so long. This was October 20th of 1995. <laughs> the previous century and I was a young man <laughs> so we go and it's I don't know it was all the things I thought it would be um, there was the red solo cups <laughs> there was the the guys pay and then they can have whatever they want and the girls get in free and a bunch of people and loud music and um, like, it was just, it was awesome. It was, it was a huge party. Uh, and this girl that I was interested in is there, and we start talking, and I'm very much enjoying myself. And she discloses to me that she's decided that she's not interested in me. She still has feelings for her ex-boyfriend. Thank you. That's exactly how I felt. <laughs> what a bummer. I, was, I went from having a very good time to being incredibly bummed in an instant. And I was talking to my other friends like, I need to get out of here. I'm completely bumming now. So two of my friends, my supervisor, Brian, and this other kid, who I don't even remember his name. I think it started with a J. <laughs> we left. My friend Brian had this great idea. It's about, I don't know, midnight, one in the morning. What you need is to go fishing at one in the morning. Yes. Which does kind of make sense. You can go. You can sit there. You can fish. You can talk out all your feelings. <laughs> uh, so it's like, yeah, let's go. So he needed to stop at his, uh, at his home and get some things, and then we were going to go fishing. So we do. Now, I, don't, I have no idea where we were. We were in the middle of nowhere. He had a trailer with somebody, and he went in. Me and this other kid that starts with a J <laughs> go into his trailer, 
And like he's just getting stuff, I think getting changed, just uh, moving around the cabin. Um, I like to do things. So I noticed that there was a dart board. So I picked up some darts and I just started playing darts. Now, uh, I don't know what kid with starts with a J is doing, but I'm just sitting here like, I'm standing here like this. There's like a couch right here going this way. And I'm just, uh, this is like my line, and I'm just throwing darts like this. And I got to say, I was doing pretty good. <laughs> it's getting pretty close to the bullseye. <laughs> um, some time goes by, and I'm just throwing darts. And then my friend uh, Brian comes, and he sits down on the couch right, right next to where I'm standing. And um, I'm not really just, I'm not paying attention. I'm just focused on throwing the darts. So at some point, he's like, hey, Mike. And I'm like, I look back and I go, what? And he has a gun pointed at my back. <laughs> I am wearing this at the time. I am wearing this, except my jeans were actually a teal color. I got mocked for that pretty bad. But this is what I was wearing. He points a gun at me, and he pulls the trigger. <laughs> he doesn't know that it's loaded. So, I've been shot. And, <laughs> start to see the lights fading in and out. I hear a kid that starts with a J say, dude, you shot him which was weird. I can feel my, I've never had this happen before, with, well, never been shot, obviously, but I started to black out, and I've never had that happen before, so I didn't know, like, what was going on, but, like, things went black as my body was going down, and I, and I passed out. I was out. I woke up in the back seat of a car, um, again, in the middle of nowhere, and I just remember I was laying down. I don't know how I got there. I was much lighter back then, so they probably carried me. <laughs> um, and I was just buckled over holding my stomach. I just remember, like, rocking saying, man, my stomach hurts. And then I passed back out. I woke up again, and I, I think we were at a gas station, and they were asking for directions to the hospital because they didn't know how to get there. Passed back out to be concluded. <laughs> mm. ah, thank you. I wake up one more time, and I am on a stretcher, <laughs> laying down, watching the lights go by on the ceiling. Um, what's the stuff they give you to try to knock you out? Anesthesia. They had been pumping that into me to, to try to get me knocked out because I was getting rushed right to surgery. I was not out yet when I felt a scalpel going right down my stomach. That knocked me out. <laughs> oh, that is a sensation I will never forget. <laughs> out cold. Now, I wake up and I'm in ICU. This is crazy. I have a breathing tube going down my throat, whatever those tubes are that go down your nose. I wake up and I am choking on this thing and can't breathe. And the nurse that comes in has the nerve to tell me, just stop breathing and let the machine do it. I've been breathing since I was approximately zero years old. How do you just stop breathing? Like, I don't. So I couldn't figure it out and was just having all kinds of problems. And they, they came in and, they, and they, they removed the breathing tube and those things that were in my nose. And that was disgusting. Just yanked them out. Um, and then, <laughs> so I'm in ICU and I... Then I'm just starting to come to and realize, like, all that's going on. 
I am in a lot of pain. I, uh, at some point I look down and there is metal staples all the way down my stomach. It looks like a zipper in my skin. And they hurt. Um, any breath beyond the shallowest of breaths was pain at a nine. <laughs> um, it was terrible. So imagine like, oh no, a yawn is coming on. <laughs> I have to cough like, oh, it was, it was horrible. And I, I couldn't eat, so they were giving me ice chips. Like that was my food. I was getting very dried out and desperate for something for moisture. And so I got to eat ice chips. That was awesome. So that was ICU. At some point, my mom, my mom is there. My mom comes and she tells me some of this stuff. And I, and I heard it from the doctors and all that. But basically, here's what happened. Uh, this bullet was from a 22 caliber rifle that was modified. So it seems like it was sawed off because it wasn't long. It was like this, but whatever. 22 caliber bullet or rifle um, was used and, and I don't know guns. I don't like guns. It's not a political thing. Hopefully you understand. I don't like them because they hurt. <laughs> These are not very powerful guns, and that was the problem. Uh, a more powerful gun would have just kind of come up and exited. This one did not. The bullet went up into my stomach and then bounced around um, and did all kinds of damage. So... Um, they had to remove several pieces of intestine that were damaged. But the, um, the biggest thing was that it, it had hit my iliac artery, which I don't know what these things are. I had to learn. You have this one main artery that comes down and splits at your legs and goes down. Yeah. So I don't know if that got severed or nicked, but it was bleeding profusely, and I had lost 80% of my blood, like into my stomach. Uh, Mom told me, this was fun to know, I, I did actually die on the operating table. Uh, flatlined. Clearly they brought me back. Um, but I was, in, I was in bad shape. And I was in ICU for two days. And then I was in wherever they send you after that for the next 11 days, uh, just recovering. And I was in a ton of pain all the time. And I would tell them my pain's at a 9. I don't think I ever tried the 10 because I wanted to leave room. <laughs> and they would give me stuff and, it, and it, just, it just wasn't good enough. I was just constantly in pain. Um, so I had trouble sleeping. I, I could not sleep. And I would have visitors coming, like family members, friends would come. And I, uh, um, and I would talk we would do all the niceties, like, thank God you're still alive, you know, good stuff. And then they would leave. But then most of the time, I was alone with my thoughts. Awake and having to face some very grim realities. And it was, it was really hard. Now, I was not a church-going person. <laughs> I was not um, a Christian that I would have called. I knew of Christianity. I had gone to a Catholic school up through fourth grade. So I knew some stuff, but I definitely did not know God. I did not know Jesus. I was living my best life. And I had become very selfish. So I am alone with my thoughts in the hospital. I am having the kind of thoughts that you don't talk about with your friends that you don't talk about with your family because they're just too heavy. Like, people just don't talk about this stuff. So, I had this overwhelming, very dark uh, fear and angst. The big question, what if I didn't make it? What if I stayed dead? And um, you don't ask your mom that. Because your mom... 
I knew, without being a theologian, without knowing much about anything, I had this knowing in my heart and my soul that if I stayed dead, I was going to a very scary place. Nobody told me that. No one would tell you that, right? This wasn't because of my knowledge of faith, a relationship with God. It was, nothing. It was just this reality, uh, this truth that was just sunk into my soul. And it scared the crud out of me. All of a sudden, all the d- debates and arguments about realities of the world and life. (laughs) There was no argument. There was no debate. I just knew. And okay, so I could tell my mom, Mom, I'm pretty sure I was going to go to hell if I stayed dead. What is mom going to say? No, honey, you're such a good boy. So I kept that to myself. I kept all that to myself. I had these very deep and heavy thoughts. I was awake a lot, and I started to pray, almost like the cliche prayers that you will hear in these situations. Dear God, if you're listening, if you're real, help, and I'll do better. I will make a deal. (laughs) And I prayed that prayer. I didn't share that with anybody. That was just my own thing because I'm not trying to scare people. I'm not trying to be the crazy person that people will stop visiting. (laughs) Um, I kept that to myself. So I get out of the hospital and I get living with my mom at this point. Me and George split up. (laughs) So my mom is helping me out. I am a terrible patient. I still am. Um, I was not very nice to my mom. (laughs) She was taking care of me. I was in a lot of pain, and I was healing. And I know that, I remember her saying, like, you're not ready to be going out and doing things yet. And I'm like, Mom, I'm gonna. (laughs) So so I started going out again. and And, you know, all of my friends wanted to hang out again and catch up and, and just, like, pretend nothing ever happened. <laughs> so I, I remember still meeting up with some friends, and they were going to be drinking. And at that time, I was like, I'm not going to do that. But I might later. <laughs> but I didn't. And then I got this invitation. I had this best friend growing up named Adam. When I moved to Hilton in fifth grade, he lived two doors down. I met him on the first day we were there. Uh, we, were, we were best friends for like 10 years. Now, Adam, it's hard, to, it's hard to believe this, but when I got shot, he was also doing the party thing, but we were doing it separately. He had a motorcycle accident where the gas cap came off of his motorcycle and exploded, and he was burned over like two-thirds of his body. This is my best friend. This is crazy. Um, and we were in the hospital at the exact same time. We actually saw each other when we were in the hospital. So afterwards, he, he reconnected with me, and he invited me to a convention thing. And this was his invite, all right? Dude, do you want to go to this thing? There's going to be a lot of girls. Full invite. <laughs> I didn't know anything but that. So naturally, I said, yes, I'll go. So, yeah. (laughs) Adam invites me to this thing. It's a convention. Now I know all these things. I didn't know anything back then. It was a Youth for Christ convention for teenagers. I was 20 years old. And... uh, (laughs) There is all of these, like, things you're supposed to do and go to, and I thought we were just going to meet girls. He also didn't tell me that he was volunteering at this thing, so he was going to be off doing volunteering, and I was going to be left alone with his church group. I didn't really know. (laughs) So, whatever. Um, I'm doing the things. When he's done volunteering, 
we do go around and meet some girls. Nothing major. <laughs> uh, it was fun. But I'm going to these workshops by myself, and I'm just putting my head down and basically going to sleep. They have these big seminar things where there's like 700 kids in the room, teenagers, and I'm basically just sleeping through it and maybe enjoying the music if it's good. That was it. Well, the second to last night, they have this speaker at this convention who gives this message that is very anti-homosexual. The teenagers in that group I was with were very upset and angry at the message they just heard from the stage. Everyone was talking to the youth leaders, like, what is this about? Why would they say this kind of stuff? And, like, people were mad. <laughs> um, no commentary. <laughs> so, I was part of the mad crew. And just like, why are we supposed to listen to these people? This is what they're saying. So the next day, they have a guy. He's a completely different guy. And wow, the mood just changed. He was funny. He was actually funny. And that got my attention a little bit. But I remember him talking about the Bible as though it's something that people take seriously. And I was like, I didn't know that. I thought it was just part of human mythology type stuff. I didn't realize anyone took it seriously. Um, and I, I went back to my, my room in the hotel that night, and they, you know, they have those Bibles in the room. I opened it, and I started just reading the first couple of chapters of Genesis, just like, I don't, I, I don't know this thing. And then I took it to my youth leader, Tim, because I read Genesis 1 and 2, the creation story, and I was like, Tim, you guys don't really believe this, right? Like, this is just a story. You don't believe it's real. And Tim, straight as could be, I absolutely believe that. I believe that it happened exactly like that. I was like, what? I was like completely shocked. I didn't, I didn't know people thought this way. I didn't know that was a thing. It's like when you discover there's this new subculture you never knew existed. It was kind of like that. I was like, I didn't know there was people like that. I had no idea. Um, so we get to the last morning. Uh, this is the last day of the convention. Looking forward to going home. And this speaker, who I don't even remember his name. Andy, Andy knows the guy, Pastor Andy. I don't remember his name. He gave this message. I have no idea what he talked about. No clue. But he said this at the end of the message. Um, he said, there's someone here. <laughs> Whew. i got to try to get contained here. There's somebody here that's going to go home exactly the same. <laughs> there's somebody here that's going to leave and nothing will have changed. And then I got scared. <laughs> I was like, this seemed a little voodoo-y to me. Is he talking to me? How could he possibly, how could he? So I'm like, this is some kind of trick. I'm going to wait this sucker out. <laughs> this is just something I don't understand. It'll go away. And he kept up. He said, there is somebody here that needs to come up here and meet Jesus or nothing is going to change. And that guy, I don't know if he just had incredible courage or if he had some kind of connection. I don't know but he would not leave it alone. <laughs> and I am sitting in my chair, in the, and I do not like to be in front of people. <laughs> and I am in this crowd of people, and there is no way 
first of all, that I would get up and that, like, this is real. This is, again, like, I'm going to wait this out. I'm going to go home. I'll figure this out. I'll talk to some people, and they'll explain. Um, and he keeps up this appeal. That somebody needs to get up here, or their life is just not going to change. You got that message. Just that. I knew where my life had been going, and it was not where I wanted it to be going. I knew about that moment that I had where something needed to change. I saw like two kids went up, and I said, thank God. (laughs) It wasn't me. (laughs) Oh, thank goodness. I was like, it's over. I can go home. And guess what? He wouldn't stop. He said, nope. There is still someone out there that needs to be here. And I was like, it doesn't matter. My feet were dug in. I, I was fixed. Now, my heart was completely racing and my legs were shaking because I was just freaked out about this situation. But I was determined I can just wait this out and it will go away. It's a good way to deal with stuff. <laughs> And then it happened. This has only happened once in my life, but it happened. And I'm either telling you an incredible truth or I'm a liar. That's not up to me to figure out. I heard a voice in my head. I talk to myself all the time in my head. I know exactly what the voice in my head sounds like. It sounds like me, thinking up some amazing things. (laughs) this was not my voice and I heard it and the voice said (laughs) God is overwhelming this is not what he said I'm just telling you I'm a little overwhelmed right now this is what he said the one you were praying to in the hospital is me. Come up and meet me. That was it. (laughs) Mm -mm. Whatever brakes I had on were released because I stood up immediately and this is amazing. The youth group that I was with that knew the kind of person I was I stood up, and there was one of these. (laughs) And then, they just moved their chairs out of the way to make sure I could get to the aisle. It was like a Moses situation. (laughs) And, um, and 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 I went up. And I'm telling you, I didn't have the language for it at the time. But as I went up, (laughs) I felt this warming of the heart that John Wesley talks about. Um, The Holy Spirit came into me. I didn't know what was going on. But I was never the same. Is God listening? Oh yeah, he's listening. And he is seeking the lost. I saved a relic that I just wanted to show you guys. (laughs) It's special to me. It's the only thing I got to keep when I was in the hospital. This is the shirt I was wearing. I was smaller then. (laughs) So I had to get a new shirt. (laughs) Yeah. And uh, you can see it in the back. That's where the bullet hole went through. So this is special to me. (laughs) 
I've saved it. It's like a relic. (laughs) So here's how I want to end it today. This is my story. I know that God, I know that Jesus is in the business of seeking the lost, and I don't know what's going on. I know I was excited to be able to share this this morning. This is going to be recorded. This is something that's shareable, and that was important to me, because if this is helpful to any of you to share with people, please do. Um, And if any of you have been praying and are hearing his voice, the worship team is going to come up. They're going to, they're going to play our last worship song. I'm going to hang out in here. If you are hearing the voice of Jesus saying that you need to do whatever, I don't know. He may prescribe something for you that is different than me. But if you need to come up, when the music's all done, I will stay here. I will be here. You can talk. We can pray. Um, and if you're online... You can reach out to me, hit me on Facebook, email. I will get in touch with you somehow. If you just want to talk, if you want prayer, um, I'll be around for that. So that is all. I'm going to pray with you right now, and then we're going to worship. Jesus, you, uh, you were listening. And... It blew my mind. It changed my life. And if you can use that to change anybody else's life, use it however you want. It's really your story. And for all of us, we know some of us have had life go in directions that we just didn't want it to go. But we are where we are and need you to turn things around. God, we pray. We pray that you would be listening, that you would hear desperate hearts, that you would be listening and that you would answer because I know you do. I know you do. So God, we pray you would speak to hearts whatever it is that they need to hear. And God, we thank you for being God and really just wanting us to come home. Thank you, Lord. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Let's stand as we close this morning. He is jealous for me Love's like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath the weight of His wind and mercy All of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory And I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. Seeing that again, he's just. He is jealous for me He loves like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath the weight of His wind and mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory And I Cause he loves us Oh, how he loves us Oh, how he loves us Oh, how he loves He loves, 
Thank you. 